Hello and welcome to NPTEL MOOCs course on Design and Implementation of Human Computer Interfaces, lecture number 11. In this lecture, we are going to talk about the next stage in the interactive system development life cycle, namely the design stage. Before we begin, we will quickly recollect the life cycle stages that we are currently discussing. So, we have seen earlier one of the stages that is the requirement gathering analysis and specification stage. Apart from this stage, there are many more stages which together constitute the interactive system development life cycle. So, we have feasibility study stage, then requirement gathering stage, design stage, prototyping stage, early evaluation of the prototype that is another stage, then coding and implementation stage, code testing stage, empirical study stage and finally, deployment and maintenance. Now, among these stages the relationship vary. For example, in the three stages design, prototype and early evaluation, they are connected in the form of a cycle. So, we first design, then create a prototype, then evaluate the prototype based on the evaluation results, we refine the design, create again another prototype based on the refined design, again evaluate and this goes on in a cycle. So, this cycle we are calling as design prototype evaluate cycle. The cycle stops when the design stabilizes, that means no further problems are found in the design after the evaluation of the prototypes. Now, this design prototype evaluate cycle primarily refers to the design of user interfaces. Apart from that, the design stage also refers to the design of the code or the program which implements the design. So, both designs are referred to by this design stage and in code testing, we test the code for its ability to execute properly along expected lines, whereas in empirical study, we test usability of the end product by involving end users in the evaluation of the whole product or software. So, these are the stages and through these stages, we try to build one interactive system that is executable as well as usable. Among them, we have already discussed one stage that is the requirement gathering analysis and specification stage. So, in this stage, what we have learned? We have learned about the idea of usability. What is meant by the term usability requirements. Also, what are the other requirements from the point of view of the system development. So, the usability requirements are non-functional requirements and we have also learned functional requirements and learned how to create functional requirements from usability requirements through one case study. More specifically, what we have learned are usability requirement gathering and one method. So, there are several methods for gathering usability requirements. We have learned one particular method that is contextual inquiry. Then we have learned the affinity diagram method which works on the data collected through contextual inquiry to analyze the results of the gathering exercise. So, we learned affinity diagram method for analysis of the requirements that we have gathered during contextual inquiry. Thirdly, we have learned how to specify the requirements. So, we have learned about SRS or software requirement specification document, how to create it, what are the conventions to be used and so on, which is required for specification of the 
requirements. So, we covered the requirement gathering, analysis and specification stage by separately learning what we mean by gathering, what we mean by analysis and what we mean by specification. Whatever we have learned in this stage, we tried to explain that in terms of one case study of an application, namely a calendar application primarily to be used by the student community who are enrolled for higher studies in higher educational institutes including colleges and universities and who are supposed to use it for academic purposes. In this lecture, we are going to talk about the next stage that is the design stage which is one of the components in the design prototype evaluate cycle. To recollect, so we have covered this stage and now we are going to talk about the design stage. Subsequently, we will talk about the other stages namely prototype and early evaluation and how the cycle is formed. So, in this lecture, we will get a general introduction to the idea of design in a software development life cycle. So, what we mean by design and what we should know and take care of in the design process. So, when we talk of design, what are the primary concerns? There are two major issues or broadly two issues that we should be aware of and we should try to address in our design activities. What are those issues? The first most obvious issue is where to start the process, where to start. So, essentially when we are asked to come up with a design, we should be very sure or we should be knowledgeable about the starting point, where to start the process. Otherwise, it may lead us to nowhere and we may end up with a faulty or incomplete design. The second major issue is once we have designed something, the concern is how to specify it, how to represent it. So, that later on in later stages when we go for implementing the design or go for doing something else on the design, we can communicate the idea of design clearly to the other members of a development team. So, the second major issue is how to represent our design in other words which language to use to represent the design. So, there are these two major issues that we should be concerned about when we are going to work on design. First one is where to start and second is how to represent. Both are very important considering that the entire life cycle is a team effort. So, one output of one stage should be passed on to the input of another stage which may be executed by a separate group, separate person or separate members of the team. So, this input that the team gets which is the output of some previous stage should be clearly understandable. So, that the new member can start working on the idea without any problem, without requiring to consult the member of the team which executed the previous stage. That is very important and from that point of view, we should keep in mind that communicating ideas from one stage to another in a very clear and precise manner is very much important and part of this overall exercise. So, we should always be concerned about that issue, how to represent and where to start. Let us now start with the first issue that is where to start, where we should start the design activity. Obviously, when the term design is mentioned, it implies that we have the freedom to think in our own way. In other words, we should have the freedom for creative thinking. So, as a designer, we should be able to creatively think and come up with a design. Now, that is one way of looking at the issue. 
Now creative thinking need not work in a vacuum. So when we say we are trying to come up with a design through creative thinking, implicitly we may be relying on our intuition or our past experience. Both may be aiding in our thinking process. So effectively when we are trying to think in a creative manner, we may be aided by the intuition which we may have and our past experience or domain knowledge, knowledge of the domain of the problem that actually influences our creative thinking. Now that is a broad way of looking at things. Now let us come to a bit more specific issues. So when we talk of UCD or user centered design, now here the design is not a single idea. Here design actually encompasses two distinct concepts. One is interface design that means the user interface that the user gets to see and interact with. Now interface design also includes design of the interaction through with this interface that means essentially interface plus interaction design that is one aspect of the design and second is the design of the system or code design. So we have these two concerns interface design which includes interaction with the interface as well. Now this is primarily from the point of view of the user and code design which is primarily point of view of the system. So both are important for getting or for developing an executable and usable product. So how to take care of these two concerns? Let us first start with the idea of interface design. To recollect when we talk of interface design essentially what we are referring to? We are referring to the user interface that means the system interface through which the user gets to interact with the system. Now the term interface implicitly contains the idea of interaction as well. So without interaction interface is not of much use. So when we say interface design we are actually referring to both design of the interface as well as the corresponding interaction. So when we are concerned about design of the interface we should be very careful because our primary concern here is usability and usability primarily depends on the design of the interface and interaction. So these two affects the usability of the product because these two are the portal through which user gets to view the system, perceive the system and achieve goals with the system. So here the main concern is to come up with a design that increases usability of the product. Now let us come back to the core issues of design, where to start and how to specify. So when we are talking of interface design, where to start? So we can start with creative thinking as we have seen before. So this is actually a prime application of creativity. How the interface should look like, how the interaction can be designed, how the interface elements should be designed, how they should be placed. Creative thinking can aid us in making all these design decisions. And as we have noted earlier, so this creativity can be aided by experience. So the designer may have experience of designing similar products before. Now that knowledge, that experience can be used, can be an influencing factor for coming up with a creative design idea. The creative thinking can also be aided by our intuition. But of course intuition again is a very complex concept and intuition comes with knowledge, with experience, with wisdom. 
So, everything actually influences the way we tend to think, we tend to create. So, the more experienced we are, it will be easier for us to come up with a creative design solution. The less experienced, it will be difficult to come up with a creative solution. So, there is no ready-made rule to tell you how to come up with a creative solution. It entirely depends on your experience, intuition and creativity. However, creative thinking is a specialized way of looking at things, but there are methods that are easier to understand and access rather than having exotic skills like creative thinking. What we can do instead is we can make use of some guidelines or thumb rules or checklists or heuristics as starting point of design. These can also aid in our creative thinking. So, that is something very important to note that there are guidelines framed to aid designers in better design, better interface design. Similarly, there are checklists created to aid designers ensure improved interface design. There are heuristics which have been developed to help a designer come up with a good design and there are thumb rules. So, all of these terms actually refer to a set of guidelines or principles using which we can create quote unquote good design which is likely to be usable. Now, why we say that when we follow a guideline, we can come up with a usable design? Because of the history of these guidelines or checklists or heuristics or thumb rules, whatever you call it, these are developed based on a long history of application of such guidelines, rules or checklists on building usable products. So, based on the knowledge gained, these sets were continuously revised, updated, so that at the end whatever they contain are proven to be useful for building usable systems. Accordingly, we can claim that whatever design we come up with based on these guidelines or heuristics can lead to improved usability, enhanced usability. That is one way of looking at the issue of where to start. So, we can start either as a creative thinker, creative designer or we can start with some set of guidelines which will aid us further in our thinking process. Now, there are many guidelines which have been developed over time for various purposes. Some guidelines are very generic in nature. That means, they pertain to very broad aspects of a design, of a usable design and because they are very generic, so they are usually small in size. That means, the number of guidelines is less in value, maybe 5 to 10 guidelines that constitute a set of guidelines for design of a particular system. So, these guidelines because they are generic usually cover broad aspects of interactive systems at a rather high level. Again, there are many such guidelines, for example, the 8 golden rule or the seven principles. The first one, eight golden rules was proposed by Ben Snyderman way back in 1986. The second one, seven principles 
was proposed by Donald Norman in 1988. Now, both these sets actually originated during the proliferation of graphical user interfaces. You may be familiar with this term graphical user interfaces. These are the interfaces that contains windows, icons, menus and pointers or what we generally call WIMS interfaces. Windows, icon, menus and pointers or WIMP interfaces. These were ubiquitous interfaces at one time, still they are very much around us. Whenever we interact with a computer, desktop computer in particular or laptop, whatever interfaces we get to see are mostly WIMP interfaces. So, these interfaces were developed way back in 1980s. At that time, what we take for granted nowadays was not so in at that time and the idea of usability was not that much developed. At that time, these golden rules or principles were developed by the corresponding persons. In the case of golden rules, it was Ben Snederman and in case of principles, seven principles, it was Donald Norman. So, these were developed to help in building GUIs that are going to be usable. So, that was the background of these guidelines. And another thing that we should keep in mind is that these guidelines did not appear suddenly out of nowhere. So, they were framed based on empirical data collected over a long period of time and after analysis of that data, some behavioral models were formed and out of those models these guidelines emerged. So, they were rooted in behavioral analysis of human users. So, whatever guidelines are proposed, if we follow them, then we are likely to get systems that will help the users use those systems. Now, these are some generic examples of guidelines. There are more detailed guidelines as well which are more specific and accordingly these are large sets. That means, each set of guidelines contains hundreds or maybe even thousands of individual guidelines. Now, these guidelines, the detailed ones are intended to cover very minute aspects of the design and the most often they are specifically meant for specific products. One example can be the human interface guidelines that was, that was developed for the Apple systems this set of guidelines contain hundreds, hundreds of individual guidelines which are primarily meant to build products on Apple platforms on Apple OS and primarily products that deal with GYs on Apple platforms. In subsequent lectures, we are going to learn about the two guidelines that I mentioned earlier, eight golden rules of Snyderman and Norman's seven principles to get some idea on what we mean by the guidelines, in this case the generic guidelines. So, that is about where to start. Now, the guidelines help us to start design, but design of what? So, here we talked of two types of design, one is interface design, other one is code design. Now, the guidelines are helpful to get us a starting point for interface design. The other aspect of the design stage is the code design for which we need to take different approach. So, for code design let us see what we can do. To repeat, when we reach the code design stage, once we complete the design 
prototype evaluate cycle and stabilize the design of the interface. So, first we start with interface design, we design something, prototype it, test it, if some issues are found out then we refine the design, again prototype it, test it. So, this cycle goes on till we reach a design which is stabilized that means no further issues are found in the design. In that case we move to the next aspect of the design stage that is code design. So, now we move to design of the system or code. Now, code design is totally different than interface design. In interface design primary concern was usability and the design guidelines were again based on users behavioral characteristics and they were primarily meant to help us design usable products, but those are not useful in code design where our primary focus is efficiency of the implementation. Along with that our primary focus is to make the code manageable that means we come up with a design which other team members can understand and manage if required modify also so that it can be implemented. So, the objectives changes and accordingly we should change our approach to address the main concerns. Now, earlier in the requirement stage we saw that we need to create an SRS or software requirement specification document as the end product of the stage. Code design actually is based on the SRS that we create. So, we need to translate the functional requirement hierarchy to the design of a system that can be implemented. So, when we talk of code design, there are two distinct phases are involved. The first one is the preliminary phase or high level design phase and there is another one that is the detailed design phase also called module specification document. So, any code design activity involves these two stages high level design and or preliminary design and detailed design or module level specification document. So, in the high level design what we need to do? We need to identify the modules that means the units which together constitute the overall system. Then define relationships between the modules, control relationships between the modules, how the modules are linked to each other and also we need to define interfaces between modules, how the modules talk to each other. So, how they are connected and how they are able to talk to each other. So, all these things we need to consider in the preliminary design phase or high level design phase. In the detailed design phase, we turn our attention to the design of individual modules, particularly the data structures and algorithms to be used to implement individual modules. So, that is the second phase of the design activity, code design activity that is detailed design phase. So, we started with two issues, broader issues for any design activity, one is where to start and how to represent. Now, earlier we saw that in interactive system design there are two types of design, one is interface design, other one is code design. For interface design starting point can be creative thinking or it can be use of guidelines, standard guidelines. Another thing we should note here is that the second issue that is how to represent the design. In case of interface design the representation is done with prototypes. So, prototypes effectively give us a language to express the design we will learn more about prototypes later. In case of code design, our starting point is this phases 
preliminary design phase and detailed design phase. In preliminary design phase, we work with high level concepts namely what are the modules, broader modules, how they are connected, how they talk to each other. And in detailed design phase, our uh, primary concerns are the data structures and algorithms to be used to implement each module. Now, let us shift our attention to what are the languages using which we can specify our designs. Now, as briefly mentioned, so when we talk of design language, we refer to specification of the design like we have seen specification of requirements using SRS which is a convention in other words we can call it a language. Similarly, we need a language to specify our design and we require different languages for interface and code design specifications. Again as I just mentioned earlier to express interface and interaction design we do not do it using natural language like English or Hindi or similar languages. Instead, what we do is we make use of prototypes. We take recourse to prototypes. Prototypes are scaled models of the designs. When we create prototype, we essentially express the design. So, prototype gives us the language to express our design. So, we can consider a prototype to be a language for expressing interface design. Now, in a later lecture, we will learn more about what are the different types of prototypes and how to create those prototypes. Clearly, we can see here that prototypes although we are calling it a language, but they are not a very formal language as such, it does not have alphabet or anything. Rather, we are using the term language here in a very loose manner whichever allows us to express something we are calling it a language and in that sense prototype can be considered to be a language to express interface design. How we can express the code design whatever we have designed through preliminary and detailed design phases how we can express that. So, what is the language we can use for expressing system design or code design? We can actually take recourse to various ways. So, there are different ways to specify a system design. Definitely, we can make use of natural languages, although it will lead to ambiguity. We can make use of semi formal languages. And finally, we can go for formal languages with clearly defined syntax and semantics which are mathematically uh, defined. So, each has its own pros and cons. If we are making use of natural language to express a system, now that is very much subjective. So, when I create a description of the system in terms of a natural language, I may be using my literary skill to express it, but later on when I pass on the message to somebody else, when I pass on the design to somebody else in my team, the particular member may not be able to comprehend it or may be having lots of confusions because natural languages are inherently ambiguous. So, natural languages although can be technically used, but are not suitable or preferable to express design languages. This leaves us with two choices semi formal languages and formal languages. Formal languages are the best way to express any design. However, because it is a very rigorous expression, it requires mathematical background and good skills in understanding the particular notations and conventions and also understanding the logical deductions that follow from the specifications. A middle ground can be found with a semi formal languages based specifications. 
which is natural language, partly graphical language and rather informal way of expressing things and easier to understand, but at the same time it reduces ambiguity. In this course, we will focus more on this semi formal language based specification of design, particularly system design. So, we will learn two such languages, one is DFD or data flow diagram which is a graphical language to express design in the form of in the form of drawings, images. Second one is also a partly graphical language where we can express design in the form of some schematic diagrams. This is called UML or unified modeling language. The first one is DFD or data flow diagrams. As the name suggests, it contains diagrams to express design which makes it easier to understand and makes it easier to maintain as well. Second one is UML or unified modeling language. This is again partly graphical language. Of course, in both the languages, natural language text is also used along with the graphical notations. So, these two languages we will learn in subsequent part of this course. So, with that we come to the end of this particular lecture. So, here we got an overview of what is design, what we mean by design. To recap, we are now going to start our discussion on the design phase of the life cycle. Now, there are two types of designs are important. One is interface design, other one is code design. Code design is also referred to as system design. So, we will use the terms interchangeably in subsequent lectures. Now, in both the cases, what we should be aware of is what we should be concerned about are two issues. One is where to start the design process and second one is how to specify the design. In case of interface design, starting point typically considered to be creative thinking aspects, but we can also start with the help of some standard guidelines. In case of code design, we start at the preliminary design phase and also complete the design in the detailed design phase. Now, the specification languages differ for each type of design. In case of interface design, we can consider prototypes to be a language, quote unquote language to specify the design. And in case of system design, we can consider different languages. However, we will focus on semi formal languages to specify the designs. Two semi formal languages we will learn, one is DFD or data flow diagram and other one is UML or unified modeling languages. In the next lecture, we will start our discussion on the design guidelines. These are the guidelines that are useful to start design of interfaces. That is all for this lecture. I hope you managed to learn the concepts and enjoyed the content. Looking forward to see you all in the next lecture. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.